epistle for this third Sunday in Advent is from Saint, letter of St. Paul to the Philippians. Brethren, rejoice in the Lord always. Again I say rejoice. Let your moderation be known to all men. The Lord is near. Have no anxiety, but in every prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your petitions be made known to God. May the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Continuation of the Holy Gospel according to John. That time the Jews sent to John from Jerusalem priests and Levites to ask him, Who art thou? And he acknowledged and did not deny, and he acknowledged, I am not the Christ. And they asked him, What then? Art thou Elias? And he said, I am not. Art thou the prophet? And he answered, No. They therefore said to him, Who art thou, that we may give answer to those who sent us? What hast thou to say of thyself? He said, I am the voice of one crying in the desert, Make straight the way of the Lord, as said Isaiah the prophet. And they who had been sent were from among the, the Pharisees, and they asked him and said to him, Why then dost thou baptize, if thou art not the Christ, nor Elias, nor the prophet? John said to them in answer, I baptize with water, but in the midst of you there is stood one whom you do not know. He it is who is to come after me, who has been set above me, the strap of whose sandal I am not worthy to loose. These sayings took place at Bethany beyond the Jordan, where John was baptizing. So the words of the Holy Gospel according to St. John. Last Tibi Christe, Jocadicta Deliante Nostra Delecta. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Brothers and sisters, this Mass is offered for a special intention from Matthew Nolan Pate. In the uh, epistle today, about the epistle today, Monsignor Boylan, whom I often cite, uh, says that uh, Paul is saying that true True joy comes from a sense of union with Christ. And so that gives us the, the peace, the joy that really abides, which is uh, what we call peace. That union with Christ comes, he says, from a deep faith, which cannot be had without a deep humility. Now, humility is a word that gets thrown around and is often misunderstood in these days. Humility is not the same as being a doormat. It is not the same as being weak. Humility is knowing our place before God. Knowing our place before God. He's the creator, we are the creatures. And because we know our place before God, then we know our place before other men. We know our place before other men. So um, we know that we're all children of God, whatever we may think of the other people. Uh, we are children of God and we all are meant or to be, uh, become saints. And, uh, of course, we have conflicts and all that. But we always, if we have what we would call enemies or people we just disagree with or get in the way of some good thing we're doing, we have to simply double up on our prayers for them specifically. True humility uh, leads to confidence in God, which is what gives us peace to be right with God, everything is right with the Lord. The threats, there are threats in this world to our peace. Serious sin, of course, destroys our peace. We get agitated, 
people are in a pattern of sin over a long, of deep, serious sin over a long time, you can see it on them sometimes, depending on what, what the sin is. The malice of others is a second thing, and it can test or wear down uh, our, our peace. And the cares of life, thirdly, can test or wear down our peace. It seems to happen a lot to people nowadays, the worries of you know, making the living and uh, whatever political worries we may have or anything else. And people get restless, they get uh, on edge, and uh, there's a threat that we would lose that sense of peace, that confidence that God is always with us, whether we're enjoying ourselves or not. So the greater the threats that there are to our peace, the greater must be our humility. Now all that being said, we look at the gospel passage today and we see that St. John the Baptist is the embodiment of this humility that leads to peace. Uh, he, uh, he identifies himself only as a voice. I should uh, give a little bit of exegesis here on the uh, old uh, discussion on the, uh, the questions they're asking him. Uh, a lot of people thought that John was the Christ and it's uh, theorized that um, John the Evangelist wrote wrote in the way that he did to stress that John himself denied that, uh, presumably because some number of followers of John the Baptist thought were kind of insistent that he was the Christ. But both uh, the, the people and who, any of the people who uh, um, thought that he was a Christ, they had the, uh, he himself denied it. And they, then they ask him, are you Elias, He's Elijah the prophet? And he says, I'm not, art thou the prophet? Uh, there was a, there's a text that in the Old Testament that says that uh, the prophecy that Elias the prophet would come back right just preceding the um, uh, coming of the Messiah. And, uh, what we know is, in hindsight, is that John the Baptist was in the spirit of, El of Elias. But what they're asking here is, are you he come back from the dead? Have you come back, Elias come back from the dead? And then when they ask about the prophet, there's a promise from the Lord to Moses that there would be a great prophet who he would raise up uh, in Israel eventually, who everybody in Israel would listen to and would follow and they would, uh, they would obey him. So he's at, they're asking all these things. So that's, what, that's where those things are coming from. And, uh, but then John says he's just a voice, a voice. He's the embodiment of humility. He identifies himself with an impersonal term a voice devoted, meaning that he is devoted solely to his mission and he deliberately excludes recognition of himself. That's humility. The Pharisees come along and they're asking, well, why are you baptizing? If you're not one of these important religious figures, why are you baptizing people, particularly Jews? Why would our countrymen need baptism. And John is, uh, is of course, uh, saying in effect that his baptism is a sacramental, uh, not a sacrament, as we put it in our terms these days, um, to help, uh, sacramental, to help stir up a sense of repentance. Well, why repentance? Why repentance? If he's announcing the joyous coming of the Messiah, uh, why not uh, to stir up joy or thanksgiving or may, maybe glory and praise? They missed a great opportunity to make a lot of bucks on a blue hymnal called Glory and Praise. 
And the reason is because true repentance requires humility. True repent, repentance requires humility. We know that especially in our sacrament of penance, in the confessional, it takes a certain level of humility. I think, I think this is why our Lord provides for this. Confess your sins to one to another. Uh, to go into a confessional and tell your mess to, through, to God through someone, the priest, who has his own mess that he has to tell another priest some other time. It takes humility to do that. To be able, and that's what the Lord wants. He wants us to be humble. He can't do anything for us unless we are humble. And we learn humble by doing humble, by doing things that are humiliating, objectively speaking, but are good for us or good for others. I can say that, you see, that that at least gives me, who am not prone to humility, a little bit of uh, humility to have to stand up here looking like a strawberry shortcake and say all these things to you. So, uh, maybe it takes guts too, I don't know. Repentance and reparation, we help empty ourselves of ourself, of ourself. If we want, Father Hardin always said, if you want to see the biggest obstacle between you and God, go look in the mirror. We have to become emptied of ourselves in order for God to fill us up. And he's not going to force that on us. So uh, we make room for Christ within so that we can have real peace. The most that John will say about the Messiah is he is the one who is to come that is in the midst of you. But he leaves by implication uh, so great that the, the much respected John wasn't even worthy to do a slave's job in his presence. So he is, he's leaving it, he's giving them a cue, but he's leaving it to the Messiah himself uh, to, to uh, announce and manifest who he is in his time. The best way to have joy and the peace that comes with it is to always be about the things of God. We keep in mind that we are first and foremost of his household then we have to behave accordingly. We have to be doing the things of God. This doesn't mean everybody goes sign up in religious orders. It does mean that God needs to be a part of our lives. I often hear people say, well, I don't, I don't, um, I, I get distracted when I'm praying because all I can think about is this controversy or this problem I'm dealing with. That's exactly what we need to take to the Lord. We might take it to the friend down the street or a friend in the office. We need to take it to God first, whatever it is that, that's given us problems. That kind of humility is laid out to us at every holy sacrifice of the Mass as the Lord Jesus again offers himself to the Father for our sins and for our needs. And as we receive worthily the fruit of that offering in Holy Communion, that is, the peace that he would give us. May God bless you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. My brothers and sisters, this week is uh, an Ember Week. It's uh, one of the Ember, Ember Weeks. And what that... What Ember Days refers to, or Ember Tide, is uh, uh, penitential times, small penitential times, four times during the year, approximately relating to the seasons of the year. It began um, way back 
and were taken up in Rome, especially for giving thanks for the blessings of the four seasons. And uh, the, they took the idea from the pagan festivals um, and where the pagans would feast during these, four, they'd feast on the time of the harvest and they'd feast at different occasions and all uh, about three times a year. Except the, where the pagans feasted, the Christians fasted. But it was a joyful fast, as Pope Leo, uh, St. Leo the Great called it. Uh, it was celebrated especially in Rome, but eventually got sent out to the rest of the church. Embertide is a special time for performing of spiritual exercises for everybody. This means uh, penitential acts but not to the same degree as uh, during Lent uh, because it, it is like Advent itself. It's both a penitential time and a, um, a time of joyful expectation. So the Advent uh, Ember Days, Ember Days are always on Wednesday, Friday, and Saturday of Ember Week. I do not know why they jump over Thursday. I don't know. Uh, if somebody knows, let me know. I've been looking, trying to look it up. Somebody gave me another hint about it uh, this morning. But those are the days, and um, the, uh, you go to the discipline of 1962, and the, um, you look at the abstinence laws. So they are days of complete abstinence, and uh, that, uh, excuse me, partial abstinence during Lent. So meat or soup or gravy made from meat is permitted once a day at the principal meals. In other words, you cut down, you do a little penance, give a little something up that's good um, uh, on those particular days. And um, the uh, Abstinence from meat is dispensed on holy days of obligation, so we don't have one of those that are right in this week. Um, the fasting applies for those ages 21 to 59, so I'm safe. Uh, the, uh, and uh, that's, that's the same as it is in the, uh, the uh, new church, is uh, uh, two smaller meals that are no to get combined are no better than one meal and you can have one full meal and all. So uh, uh, it's a time of moderate uh, self-mortification. I'm bringing all this up because it's uh, awfully important, especially in these times, but it's important anytime, even though the Ember Days were originally tied to uh, agricultural systems nonetheless. Uh, it is a great time for opening ourselves up to the Lord's presence, and it's a good way to do that in a, in a systematic way. Say special prayers, give up a little something on those days. And um, remember also, uh, it's a time for praying for, uh, it's a time where they, in the um, traditional way, the Popes moved ordination days to those ember days. They would have it during an ember week. They would have ordinations of priests. So we can, uh, it's recommended we say special prayer by, by everyone for vocations to the priesthood and also for the sanctification of the priests that we have. So all of this is real important, maybe especially that last part. And... Uh, I urge you families to do it. There are masses and procession instructions provided during those days, but I am assuming this year that that's not likely to uh, be all that doable as our society is organized nowadays and people do work. Um, but maybe in the future we may, uh, we may do that. But, how it used to be was they'd have a procession in Rome and the Pope would lead it and they'd go to one stational church to another and they'd have a big do uh, for that. So uh, we ain't ready for that yet, but uh, someday we will be. God bless.
bless you.